Hi, and welcome back to Blogging Heads Foreign Entanglements. I'm one of your new hosts, Natalie Samby. I'm an analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Canberra, and I'm managing editor of our official blog, The Strategist. And joining us today for an interesting discussion on China, its foreign policy, and its leader, Xi Jinping, is a program director for East Asia at the Lowy Institute for International Policy in Sydney, Dr. Meriden Varrell. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Natalie. Marion, just for a bit of background, you've obviously been working on China for a number of years. I was wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about your time in China and what made the biggest impression on you. Sure. Um, so I've, I've probably been studying China since I was an undergraduate in Sydney. Um, I spent a year as an exchange student in 1999 in Tianjin and Hangzhou. Um, during that time, I neglected my Chinese language studies and travelled around the country instead. So I saw a lot of um, the out, out to the western provinces, including out in Tibet and, and Xinjiang. I went back a few years later and I worked for the International Labour Organization on a project that was about um, protecting women and girls from trafficking when they migrated from rural areas of China to the urban centres of China. Uh, and then I started working on my PhD on Chinese foreign policy. So I spent a couple of years doing field work there for that, um, which involved a lot of interviews of academics and policy commentators. I was trying to get access to policy makers, but of course that was probably a bit naive uh, and I had to sort of circle around that community rather than be actively involved in that community. So I spent a couple of years doing that. And then I got a job working at the United Nations Development Program and I was working on South-South uh, cooperation. So whilst the, the United Nations Development Program usually concentrates on development in country, in this program what we were looking at was how China engages internationally in its development assistance and overseas aid. So, of course, um, looking a lot at the, the politics of that international engagement, working very closely with the Ministry of Commerce and learning a lot about how China understands its, its obligations to the world that it um, that it that is manis that are manifested through the way it does its aid program. So all up about um, eight years in China doing those those kinds of things. And sure, and obviously oh, I should mention. Sorry, no, I forgot the important thing. I, I also spent um, a year teaching um, foreign policy at the China Foreign Affairs University, which is the feeder institution into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's actually not run by the Ministry of Education, it's run by the MFA. So I spent a year there working with the um, these young people who are being trained to be the future elites, uh, the diplomatic elites of China. And that's where I got a lot of my learning about how China views the world. So just in terms of how China views the world, I know you've written about this on the Lowy Institute's blog before. I just was hoping that you could probably summarise what some of those worldviews are and, and just sort of explain, I mean, has that changed much since Hu Jintao to now under Xi Jinping? Yeah, no, the worldviews are really interesting and um, and I think they're a really important part of understanding how China behaves in the international system. And it's an interesting point that you raise about the continuity between Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping. Um, I would argue that their goals, overarching goals are, are the same, and that is fundamentally to keep the party in power. And when you read official speeches and statements, the emphasis is always about strengthening the party, strengthening the party. It's not even necessarily about the country, it's about the party. So this is the, this is the coherent and continuous purpose of the leadership. Um, now, this requires keeping the country strong and unified, and I would argue that there are two main pillars to that. One is material well-being, and that's been particularly the case since the 1989 Tiananmen incident, and the other pillar is a sense of national identity. And it's in, in this sense of national identity that the, these worldviews that matter to international relations really, uh, really exist. I think the first important worldview that I would um, argue has, has relevance for Chinese foreign policy is this really strong narrative of the century of humiliation and overcoming that, and particularly the, the party's central role in overcoming this century of humiliation. In fact, the party's managed to, um, to create an, a, a truth in which it is the party that has been responsible for bringing China out of this, this century of, of being um, persecuted and humiliated by foreign powers. So in a way, those, those are synonymous. The party and coming out of humiliation uh, have been made synonymous. The second theme, I think, is history as being destiny, that this that China as a great country, which was um, ruptured, that truth was ruptured by the century of humiliation, 
and the CCP is bringing it back to where it should be, and it is in historically inevitable that it will resume that its natural role, its sense of natural, inevitable destiny, that it will continue the trajectory that it had before it was interrupted by the great powers in the century of humiliation. Third one, cultural characteristics are immutable. And this is this is the idea that we Chinese are like this and you others are like that. And those are understood just to be just to be true. Now the cultural characteristics for Chinese, you, you see them in the kinds of talk about being, you know, we've always been peaceful and therefore we'll always we will be peaceful. And you hear the stories about Zhong He and his fleets and how they went out and and they never expanded and they never invaded. They just borrowed a few giraffes from Africa and brought them back. And um, so there's this real, real uh, feeling that that's how we have always been and that's how we always will be. So we don't understand why you, the rest of the world, are so worried about us when we're just nice guys. I mean, we've always been nice guys. The flip side of that is how the cultural characteristics of countries like Japan or the US are painted. And, for example, the US is... is it's understood to be always imperialistic, expansionist, trying to believe in its own ideology is appropriate for everyone and applying that ideology, in fact, actively expanding to apply that ideology onto others that thinks that that's right for everybody all the time. And that the US has always been bullying and humiliating and trying to keep China down. And given this idea of continuity in cultural characteristics, that, that means that everything that the US does now is coloured by that perception. It doesn't matter if the US says A or it says Z or it says, says something black or it says something white, that's received in terms of this existing truth that, oh, well, you would say that, wouldn't you, because you're trying to keep us down and encircle us and bully us like you always have. So that makes trust building and communication extremely difficult between the two. Japan, as well as particularly we've seen now in China's reaction to, the, to Abe's speech last week, Japan is always understood as being cruel, expansionist, unrealistic about its past and, and a, a really serious threat to China and to the stability of the region in a, in a, in a pernicious, destructive way. And, and so you see, you know, whatever Abe had said in that speech, you know, he used the words that, that he was supposed to use, but the Chinese media reported back saying it wasn't sincere enough. So it doesn't really matter what Japan does. They will be viewed in this in this paradigm sorry that was a long explanation for the third one and the fourth one is the idea of china as family and that this sense of of shared identity that we are chinese you hear it quite a lot and you the rest of the world and the rest of the world is generally quite undifferentiated unless unless you you really push for the specifics but it's very much us coherent unified chinese versus the rest of the world so I think those are the four major narrative shells. Those are kind of overarching headline narratives, but under those is, is room for debate. I think those can't be really shifted easily, but in within those, there's room for debate and discussion. What does it mean for how China can overcome the century of humiliation is possible to be discussed and argued. And I think that's where there might be room, we can talk about that a bit more later, for influencing China and working with China in the international arena. Uh, Madden, obviously narratives go both ways. And if we're talking about China, I mean, particularly from an Australian perspective, and I believe probably from an American perspective as well, China often comes up in the media in the context of the South China Sea, in terms of assertive behaviour, in terms of, you know, a rising power. And around those sorts of media reports is a sense of anxiety, a sense of uncertainty and a sense of, of worry. Um, is that a fair assessment, do you think? Do you think there's something more that we are missing as the other, in a sense? <laughs> sure. Um, it's, it's, it's become, I think, an accepted fact in Western, and I'm using that term loosely, and um, but... US, Australia, British media, that China's behaviour in the South China Sea, for example, and the East China Sea is a source of considerable concern. And I wouldn't underestimate that because we don't know what China is trying to do. The evidence that we see, you know, land, not even reclamation, claiming, building um, these kinds of um, runways, long, long runways that look like they're going to be for military purposes. You know, it's a bit disingenuous for China to, to argue that, oh, no, that's not what we're really up to. It's, it's, it's not reassuring at all. So we, have, we, we can't be sure about what, what's happening there, but it does 
look from everything that we can see to be a source of concern and anxiety. Um, that does, of course, as you say, um, there's narratives that exist there. We are concerned about China. So what China is doing feeds into those concerns. But that's not to say that they're unfounded. The question then is, and what is a, heat, a heated debate at the moment, particularly in the lead up to the US elections, is what do we do about it? Mm. Um, if we don't like it, which we evidently feel that we don't, what what can we do? And a lot of the discussion in the in the um, public policy circles at the moment um, is is getting tough on China. The idea of putting skin in the game, not accepting China's bad behaviour. You know, you hear this kind of language: China is pa behaving badly, and we simply shouldn't put up with that anymore. So, why would will that be effective? I guess is is the question. Um, I think we have to. As part of that question, look again at, at the domestic concerns, the domestic motivations behind why China might be doing what it's doing. And going back to those ideas of those two key pillars of party legitimacy as being the, the, the really driving motivation for Xi Jinping and his, and his foreign policy, you've got the material well-being idea and you've got that national identity idea. And that national identity is based very much on, on this sense of sovereignty and territorial integrity, that, that we as a Chinese nation, it's, it's, it's about our land as much as it's about anything else. And so things like Taiwan and Tibet and Xinjiang are emotional concerns for China. It's not just a kind of strategic thing about whether there might be oil or some other useful mineral deposits. It's absolutely a sense of your core self. And what I think is interesting is that the the South China Sea is becoming increasingly discussed in that kind of terminology, increasingly seen as, as being just as much a part of China's psyche um, as, as those longer standing ones like Taiwan, etc. So that's, that's an interesting shift and it's, an, it's a shift that is raising a lot of concern, of course, in the region as well. I mean, we mustn't forget that this isn't, this isn't just about China and the US, this is about the countries in the region too. So it's causing a lot of concern there too. Ashley, you've given me just a, a bit of a hook there for my next question. I mean, on the one hand, you've got this sort of assertive behaviour by China. And then on the other hand, you've got a China that's prepared to engage with Southeast Asian countries. I mean, obviously, from my perspective, I see, you know, the Indonesian president going to China and, and looking to, uh, you know, cooperate even further on economic sort of areas. Um, there's a sort of sense that China's policies, economic policies, you know, the one belt, one road, the 21st century mm -hmm. maritime silk road policies are a means of getting these ASEAN states um, on board, sort of convincing them that they're benign or getting them, you know, buying them off, so to speak. So if we engage with you and invest in you, that you won't uh, whinge so much about what we're doing in the South China Sea. Do you think that's, is that fair? Is that a sort of a balanced way of seeing that? Or is there more to it again? There's always more to it, I think. Um, but you're right that, I mean, economic diplomacy is, is, a, is a, an absolutely a strategy that the Chinese are pursuing, um, that, they, that they're that they thinking about the longer term game. They, they, they usually don't conduct foreign policy in a short term way. There's, there'll be moments where they're having a quick reaction to some kind of um, challenge or stimulus, but generally speaking, it's a long game that they're playing. Sure. And and economic diplomacy is a part of that. Actually, Sorry, go ahead. Before, I was just going to say, actually, you know, probably the benefit of our viewers, perhaps we should just summarise the One Belt, One Road and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road uh, policies as well. Right, summarising those. Um, it's in, in absolute summary, it's a net... It's a network of uh, economic cooperation. Um, so the One Belt, One Road, the idea is that China's existing kind of bilateral corporations and investments will become under, will become under a more strategic um, heading and, and they're focusing on trying to, well, I mean, it's debatable, but it seems to me that they're trying to um, create a, a network around China um, that is beneficial for China and those countries equally. You're probably better to, to look it up somewhere for, than for me to try and explain it. Yeah, but yeah. that's the sort of summation of it. Sure. And, and and my understanding of the 21st century Maritime Silk Road is is about linking up oh, yes. the Middle East um, with East Asia, and that also includes doing things like building ports and things like that, uh, railroads across right. Pakistan leading down to Bangladesh, right. and, and obviously that's how Indonesia's uh, interest in maritime affairs segues well with China. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. No, 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 that, no. Sounds, that sounds very accurate. So, so 
you mean from from just the way you've explained that it's evident that there's things there's an issue there about resources um access to resources those kinds of logistics for supply and there's also issues there about um china's own domestic um overcapacity in certain things and expanding that so there's there's lots of different angles to it um to both to these kinds of strategies and the um AIIB the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank is also a part of that that whole picture of so it's economic diplomacy but it's also it's also about resources and material um stability and well-being in the longer term so i think a lot of people see that as as sometimes being um a little bit hard to understand when china build trying to build these networks and as you say um being a nice guy in these regards whereas at the same time they they're apparently being so so um disregarding of other countries in their immediate vicinity and their and their feelings when they're for example building islands in the south china sea and you know how how do we how do we reconcile those to apparently um opposite approaches if you're being nice why are you being nasty and i think actually they're just they're just two sides of the same coin again if you go back to the domestic imperatives then you can see that that they're not uh, inconsistent in fact they they are two sides of the same coin when you're looking at those party party legitimacy as being the core goal the two pillars of material well-being and national identity you cannot cannot be seen to be slacking off on territorial integrity and sovereignty and at the same time you must be building these um routes for international access to resources and diplomatic strengthening so they're two parts of exactly the same thing when you when you can see that domestic imperative as the core goal I mean it sounds to me you know you said it with the narrative shells uh that they are pretty consistent they they they're going to be hard to evolve um you know we debate below that notwithstanding um and given that party legitimacy seems to be paramount it doesn't seem that those narratives are going to change anytime soon um if that's the case i mean you and i being australians will often think about it from an australian perspective and i think there'll probably be lessons for other countries dealing with china as well i look man in your understanding if that's the case and these narratives are so strong how are we as a country for australia for instance how are we going to approach and engage with china and try and build an understanding given that there is this sort of us us and them sort of type narrative right it's it's a, it's it's really the question that's troubling a lot of policy makers and commentators at the moment and and um it's a very difficult question because i think since since even the the late 1960s and the early 1970s the understanding in the US and Australia has been that you know China is an is, is an outlier and we must do everything we can to get China to join the international community the family of states the international system and how do we do that engage coerce um what is it that, that's the best technique to do that and i think there's a sense at the moment that that everything we've tried to do hasn't worked that here's china after all these decades of of trying to get them to be more like us and it hasn't worked and there's a really strong sense of frustration there and i think that's what's giving rise to this all this the, the talk about we must put more skin in the game we must be tougher on china being nice hasn't really cut the mustard so my argument though is that we need to think very carefully about a short term reaction to what china is doing say with the east china sea and the uh, south china sea and the longer term goal and we have to be very clear about what we want to achieve in fact with china in the longer term if we think that pushing back hard on china and um chastising it humiliating it and i use those words probably from a taking from a chinese perspective if we think that that's going to make china want to become an active responsible player in the international system i think we're perhaps misguided i think what we need to do is we need to be very clear about our short term objectives and our long term objectives what's worth pushing back against now if the longer term results of that are going to be a more recalcitrant more distant more marginalized more victimized china this is not at all to say that we should appease china let china do whatever it likes say oh well you know that's how you see you guys see the world so that's cool you, you carry on do what you like not at all but if we want 
to achieve our longer term objective. We have to understand those kinds of perspectives in order to have effective and sustainable um, results. So we need to be clear about where we think our norms and challenges, norms and values are being challenged, and we need to be firm about responding to them. Um, but we need to make sure that's not just about China, that it's about anybody anywhere who is challenging those norms and values. And it's helpful if we sign up to the things that we're encouraging China to uh, to support. I mean, UNCLOS, when I say we, I don't mean Australia in that particular sentence. Um, so we need to be fair, we need to be objective, we need to be applying our values equally and including to ourselves. We need to try and find areas of shared interest and we need to build on those. We do need to try and build up this sense of mutual trust. And as I said before, it's difficult because China has a perspective about who we are, what we're trying to do. And the only way to overcome that is to really to work together, to be together, to enhance communication, to enrich communication. So, so working together on projects, for example, development in Southeast Asia or in the Pacific gives us an opportunity to get to know each other and to build the kinds of connections so that when something does go wrong, when some kind of crisis emerges, we can have a channel of communication that that is stronger than that, that momentary crisis and so that communication and trust will still exist in the background. And I think we just don't give up on diplomacy. We, 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 we in fact, enhance it. We, in fact, enrich it. We go further and we think more long term about how we can build those kinds of channels and networks to make sure that we have a background to fall onto when when tensions and crises emerge. So the Australian policy of the Colombo plan, for example, is not a bad start in that regard. Oh, and just, you know, for our viewers, the Colombo plan that we've got at the moment is uh, introduced by our current foreign minister, Julie Bishop, um, which is about sponsoring Australian students to get out into Asia to increase what we like to call Asian literacy, which not only includes Asian languages, but obviously understanding the political and cultural context of our Asian partners. Um, and it's right. a new version of, of a Colombo plan that we had many decades ago, which brought scholars and students from the region to Australia. So this is a reverse version. Yeah, and an important, really important component of it is that it's not about necessarily just going out and um, promulgating the Australian perspective on the world to these lucky recipients. It's also about genuinely trying to understand what their perspective is and bring that back to Australia. So it's supposed to be very much a mutual learning experience, which I think is important. Meredith, I was wondering if we could return back to your point earlier about Working together in the South Pacific, and in particular, if, I mean, for some of our viewers that may not know, the South Pacific or Southwest Pacific is seen as a very important strategic area for Australia, in addition to Southeast Asia and other areas of the Asia Pacific. Um, and Australia has been responsible for uh, taking the lead in stabilisation operations and peacekeeping in the past. Um, in the, in recent years, we've seen China increased Chinese involvement, I would say, perhaps in some of these countries in terms of investment and in terms of building diplomacy. Um, and I think perhaps in this country we've seen that as a slightly competitive arrangement. Do you see that continuing to be competitive in the future or how is it that we could perhaps, um, you know, uh, actualise what you're suggesting, which is actually to work together? Do you think China um, would go for that? I so I think there's certainly areas that China would go for that. And and so in terms of the competition between Australia and China, that's it's certainly been true in the area of aid and development in, in Pacific Island countries. There's really been a, a, a strong sense of concern from the Australian aid and development community that, that China's involvement is undermining our efforts. Um, and, and the certain the case that um, a lot of Chinese projects have not been particularly successful from a development effectiveness point of view. There's um, great examples in Papua New Guinea where Chinese companies, Chinese state-owned enterprises, have been developing uh, mine sites and their lack of knowledge about the local people and local situation um, has, has really caused massive problems for themselves ultimately, um, but certainly in terms of how, how development is um, being implemented. I should note, though, that they're not necessarily development projects through the Ministry of Commerce's overseas development program. Um, Australia, though, I think could do better in engaging with China. Um, one of the primary principles, though, that makes that um, challenging is that China really, really believes in um, that 
that any kind of cooperation or any kind of um, discussion needs to be driven by the host country. So in Papua New Guinea, if Australia says, China, we should get together, we should talk about Papua New Guinea, China will say, does Papua New Guinea want us to talk about them? And if Papua New Guinea says, no, not particularly, or no, we haven't heard about this, China will say, well, then we don't need to talk. And that's pretty reasonable. Um, it's, 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 it's not a bad idea to, to involve the host country in your conversations about the host country. But there's still many, many areas in which if you get the host country involved, you could have some very, very fruitful conversations, work together a lot more. There's 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 fisheries um, protecting. In fact, that's a really good one because um, protecting and sustaining fishing um, stocks, fish stocks, is hugely important to China. It's hugely important to Australia. It's hugely important to the Pacific Island countries. So that's just one quick example where we could work together so long as China and the host partner country are happy for us to do so. That's going to be really interesting. As some of our viewers may or may not know, Australia's cut its aid budget. Um, so perhaps we have to have a, little bit, have a little bit more targeted strategies when it comes to South Pacific. But you've certainly given us a lot of fruit for thought, Merit, and I think we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> yes, yes. We've always got a lot of work to do in the yes. relations. Yes, yes, we do. Um, and so well, one last question for today um, you and I have had discussions about this in the past. Um, you know, you in particular have been looking to encourage female voices with international relations, particularly Australian uh, scholars working, female scholars working in international relations. You know, we're getting there, but um, just, you know, one final thought, what more can we do? That's one final thought. I mean, so much. There's, we, we're making some small progress, but we really um, have still got a long way to go. Um, I think that the most obvious evidence of that is when you go to international relations events and it's a male host with male discussants on the male panel and the participants are mostly male and the questions are mostly male and and you know sometimes I feel rude but I want to just send out a Twitter post saying you know hashtag all male panel again um, I think I think building networks among women and encouraging and providing opportunities for women to to take some public space is is a is a step that we can really um, it's a kind of the first step that needs to be taken. There's no shortage of capable and intelligent and articulate women on these topics, but it's a, they're not because they're not on the circuit. They're not immediately thought of. You have to dig a little bit harder to find them. Um, but if we can start doing that, we can start giving them public space. Then then the the problem starts to automatically. I hope. Uh, solve itself. So I think we should all, you know, every day, try and <laughs> every time we have an opportunity to have a panel or to ask a question or to take public space, we should we should do what we can to support other women and and take that opportunity ourselves too. Excellent. Well, there's always that Madeleine Albright quote: "There's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women." Oh my God, that's terrifying. Yes. Okay, I remember <laughs> that as well. <laughs> All right, Meredith. Look, I'll let you go, but thank you so much again for making time all the way in Sydney for us today in Canberra. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, and we hope to have you again. All right, have a good one. See ya. Bye.